Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming May of 2019 premiere auction. Today we have basically the best product improved version of the Browning model of 1919 air cooled machine gun. This is an M37, and it's uh, actually well, it's a post-World War II development. Uh, in 1950, in November of 1950, the US military requested basically an improved 1919 uh, specifically for use as a tank-mounted machine gun. So they were developing some new tanks after World War II. And the problem with the regular... well, the regular 1919 had a couple issues. There were a few bits on it that had turned out to be not as durable as maybe everyone would like. And more importantly, it only fed from one side. And that's fine for an infantry gun where it doesn't really make any difference. But when you go to mount a machine gun like this in a tank, or as they would later do in a helicopter, it becomes much more important which side the gun feeds from. So the Army wanted a version that could be switched to feed from either the left or the right, so that they could mount it into a cramped space in a tank or other vehicle. Now initially there were some modifications made to the standard 1919A4, um, and that was temporarily adopted as the 1919A4E1, uh, and they converted something like 18,000 guns to that new pattern. But at the same time they had folks working on developing a from scratch new model that would be better. Um, and the guy who ended up with the job of designing this was a guy named Bob Hilberg, who worked for the High Standard Company. Now Bob Hilberg uh, had his hands in a bunch of other firearms designs. He'd been working as a firearms designer through World War II. Uh, clever guy, had not a well-recognized name, but uh, had a lot of other uh, guns to his name, especially at High Standard. And at this time he was the chief engineer at High Standard, and this project kind of just fell into his lap. High Standard was doing a bunch of other work, the R&D department was busy with civilian arms, and so he ended up pretty much doing this by himself. And what they ended up with, the, the first design, actually before it got to Hilberg, was the T-151. That wasn't so successful. Uh, they gave it to Hilberg, he redesigned it as the T-152, which was quite a bit more successful. They did some trials on that, decided they really liked it, made a few tweaks, became the T-153, which was formally adopted by the US military as the M-37. It wasn't actually produced by High Standard, it was actually produced by the Rock Island Arsenal and the Seiko or Sako uh, Lowell Company in between 1955 and 1957. And unfortunately I was not able to find any good data on exactly how many uh, they made, but many thousands of these things. They would be used in the M48 and the M60 tanks, as well as the uh, a couple of different helicopters, uh, early helicopters in the US inventory. And this really is the perfected version of the Browning 1919. So well, let me go ahead and show you what all they changed to it. All right, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on back here that you can see. So we have a link ejection chute, and this is just pinned in place with this pin. Uh, the same way that some of the feed poles on the other side are pinned in place. Uh, we'll get up close at that in a moment. We have this replacement charging handle. So the original 1919 had a charging handle sticking out right here, side of the bolt where you would expect it. But if you're going to go mount this in a vehicle, you don't necessarily have easy access up here. So what they did was put a charging handle on that puts a handle right behind the pistol grip so that it can be easily operated from either side and without having to get up to the front of the gun. The top cover latch has been simplified, and they gave it these two easy open knobs. That's a definite improvement over the original 1919. Although remember that uh, these are modifications that wouldn't really have made sense necessarily on an infantry gun, because, well, this is a lot of stuff to get in the way and to snag on things. That's not an issue inside a tank. It would be an issue if you were out carrying the gun around. The back of the top cover plate here has been uh, redesigned, so we still have an iron sight mounted on top of it. Um, however, it, the casting is a bit different to accommodate this. We have an improved uh, latch system to remove the back plate. Removing the pistol grip has been much simplified. This is a, a nice improvement over the original gun. So on here, if you push this over, that's like the safety latch, and then you can push this tab down, and then the back plate of the gun just slides off very nicely. We still have the hydraulic buffer in there. The protective, or the, the 
tabs on either side of the receiver here have been strengthened, um, made a little bit bigger. We have a safety here on the bottom of the gun now. That's fire. That is safe, and all that does is simply drop in place a little block that prevents the trigger from going up. The original 1919s really didn't have a convenient safety. One of the other really nice improvements, perhaps in fact the best, the most significant improvement of the gun overall, is the use of a captive recoil spring. So on the original 1919 you had to actually use a very long screwdriver through the backplate of the gun to basically catch the recoil spring, rotate it 90 degrees, and lock it in place before you could take the gun apart. And goodness help you if that thing came unlatched and went flying across the room. It was a real mess to try and get back into the bolt. On the M37, Hilberg gave it a much simpler captive recoil spring. So a very nice improvement there. The rest of the disassembly is pretty much the same. Uh, you're going to pull the bolt back to here and pull out this plug. This is what would have originally been the charging handle. It now really acts as the same thing, but this handle hooks onto it. That also prevents the bolt from coming out. That pin removed, I can take the bolt out. This is basically mechanically the same. However, instead of one track for the feed system to run on, it has two. You can see these two holes here, uh, where some of the, uh, the aircraft conversions of the 1919 during World War II had these complex feed plates on top. Uh, Hilberg simply gave this a pair of wedges right here that are reversible. So you can pull them out, and there are two matching holes like this in each track. So you pull them out of there, push them over to these two holes, drop them in, and that allows you to reverse uh, the feed direction. Looking up here at the front end of the gun, everything is reversible. So we have a mounting point on the left side of the receiver here with this cross pin that holds in place your feed pawl. On the other side we have the exact same mounting points, and over here they're holding in your cartridge guide and your chute ejector. Uh, the chute ejector here is another important addition uh, for a tank gun. This ensures that the links, um, shoot ejector, link ejector. This ensures that the links uh, will be dropped nicely into most likely a carry bag, so that they don't end up flying all over the inside of the vehicle. When it comes to operation, this charging handle actually also kind of does double duty. You can see there's a stud here that prevents it from going too far forward, and there's a notch right there. When I lock this back, there's a spring detent right here that pushes this handle downward and causes this notch to lock into the frame right here. What that does is effectively give you a manual hold open. So this will keep the bolt open. Now the Browning is a closed bolt gun, so in order to close the bolt all I have to do is grab the handle, lift it upward, and disengage it from that lock. And then the bolt goes forward. One last thing I want to point out here are the markings on the side of the gun. Uh, this simply has a serial number, and then it's marked uh, Gun Machine Caliber 30 M37, Pearl Manufacturing, Grants, New Mexico. Uh, this was actually a private company that was building transferable machine guns uh, before 1986. So they created the side plate for this gun, and then built it using a military parts kit. Um, those are not the original markings that you would see on an original military side plate. Those would be marked uh, either uh, Rock Island Arsenal or Saco Lowell. So there you have the M37, the final ultimate product improved version of the Browning air-cooled machine gun. These would serve in uh, US military until the late 1960s, even after uh, various other guns had been adopted that were supposed to take their place, uh, notably the M73 and the M85, both of which were pretty much failures. Um, these would be used in both the M48 and the M60 tanks, as well as a couple of early helicopters. There is one, <laughs> there's one cool uh, anecdote that, there's one funny anecdote that I want to share with you about this. Um, when Hilberg was designing the gun, uh, Springfield Armory was eager to get get his first guns in for testing as quickly as possible. Um, they had in fact, uh, they'd contracted not just for one, but for I think 25 prototypes. And as soon as he had the first half of those guns done, Springfield wanted them. So 
Hilberg, you know, high standard was not that far away, so Hilberg threw a dozen of these guns in the back of his car, which was a cute little convertible, and threw a blanket over them. And this was the summer, so he just left the top of the car down and went cruising up the highway uh, to Springfield. And when he went through one particular toll booth, uh, it turns out, without him realizing it, the blanket had blown off of the guns in the back, and this toll booth attendant has sees this guy come through in a little cute convertible with a dozen belt-fed machine guns lying in the back seat, and doesn't say anything but calls the police, and Hilberg doesn't find out about it until uh, a few minutes later when he's driving down the highway and is uh, pulled over by a gaggle of Massachusetts highway patrolmen. Uh, apparently he'd, he hadn't bothered to bring any papers with him or anything, and had a hard time proving his association with Springfield or with the High Standard Company. And I guess it sounds like he spent something like an hour on the side of the road trying to explain what was going on before successfully uh, making his case and then receiving a nice police escort the rest of the way uh, to Springfield. It is interesting that these guns were actually originally developed in 30-06, even though by the time they were put into production, 762 NATO was clearly the coming thing. Uh, they would in fact do some additional alterations, and they would come out with the M37E1 version of this, which was in 7.62 NATO, and incorporated a couple other changes as well, most notably uh, fixed headspace instead of adjustable headspace for the gun. But uh, that's not what we're looking at today. What we have here is the original 30-06 version. So uh, this is a fully transferable uh, NFA registered machine gun, so if it's something that you are interested in getting, take a look at Rock Island's catalog. Uh, you'll be able to check out all of their pictures and information, uh, details on this guy, as well as everything else they have coming up for sale. Thanks for watching.